This is uh, HRT 125, Plants and Society, uh, Unit 15, Ecology, Part 3. We have been talking about uh, habitat formation, uh, bio niches, and how they are so important uh, for the world today. I talked about uh, millions of species on Earth and not one of them rely only upon themselves. They need other help from different species, whether it's plant or animal. Here's a picture of uh, baobab trees in Madagascar. These are very unique. You see how the trunks are just filled with water. Uh, that's how they react to it raining only several times a year. They store water here. However, these plants are only found in Madagascar. It's very tough for them to uh, be moved around uh, in different conservatories because they're pollinated by specific moths. Uh, these moths are also uh, treated by certain mooners and the only way for it to be pollinated at the one time of year is a combination of these moths and lemurs working together. So the loss of the moth or the lemur means that we won't have these trees anymore. In uh, South America, along the Amazon River Basin, as we all know, that was filled with uh, jungle. Uh, the jungle was so thick that you couldn't even walk uh, in it. What has happened, though, that it's much more efficient for the natives to use the land to, to grow cattle instead. So if they burn down the woods, they can just turn the cattle in there. The cattle will eat up the remaining grasses and plants, and they can get a lot more money. So it becomes very easy for the natives to get rid of uh, jungle land here. We also see that uh, plants can come to different ecosystems and take it over. Here's an example of pampas grass. Do you know it's a tall grass-like thing? And it's got beautiful fronds that get up there. It can be any place from four to eight feet tall. Uh, very easy to maintain. However, it has no enemies within the northern part of the United States. So consequently, it will continue to grow and grow and will take over your yard if left alone. The bugs that are up here in the United States won't bother this plant. So it continues to grow. Can we use our technology to save all these different ecosystems? Could we get enough energy out there that we don't have to use fossil fuels? Right now, we use energy from uh, fossil fuels, very little from solar power, um, using more from gases. But could we do all the same from solar cells? We actually could fulfill the solar needs of the United States in just a small percentage of the land in Nevada. We could fulfill all the electrical needs that we have for the United States very easily. The map shows the best places to have solar power, uh, but solar power can be in other areas too to uh, decrease the amount of our dependence upon coal or gas. So it, it is possible. We worry so much now about the whole idea that uh, of, uh, greenhouse gases, the earth getting warmer. And when we started off the course, we showed you graphs of how the earth was getting warmer, how the CO co content was rising. And this is what's happening here. It's the whole greenhouse effect where you see the sun coming in. And as it brings its energy, some of it's reflected back because of the ice cap. It's white, so it reflects it back. The darker color of the ocean and the land absorbs the sun's rays. What is happening right now, uh, that the stuff that is reflected back into space is not as high as it could be. So that we are absorbing more and more heat. If you look at the newspapers, 
you'll see that uh, the polar ice caps are shrinking. And as they are shrinking, they're losing more of the sea visible, more darker colors, so more energy from the sun is kept on Earth. Right now, uh, our food chains rely upon the sun, rely upon this warmth. We have all these wonderful food chains that depend upon different groups needing the lower group to advance up the food chain. It's not just in this little picture right here where we see the birds and the squirrels and the uh, bacteria down below. It continues for every single organism on Earth. We build all of these pyramids of food chains right here. Um, we build the chains of the the fish, for example, in the northwest part of the United States. We talked about how the, the bears there uh, wait every year to for the salmon to run. But it turns out that the salmon then, as they are brought upon the land, the bears eat the ovaries and the brain because that's the highest amount of calories and then dump the rest of the fish. Now it turns out that there's a small slug that looks disgusting, people don't want around. But if you look at get rid of that slug, all of a sudden some of the salmon are not turned back into nutrients. If we look at the DNA of the bears, it's filled with lots of DNA from the salmon. If you look at the DNA of the pine trees in the area, it's filled with DNA of the salmon again. So this small slug, which is the bottom part of the primary producer here, is very important for the whole area to exist. If it wasn't for the slug, the bears would starve and the trees would starve. Here's a picture of the earth and why it te temperature is different in different areas. You know, the sun is coming in with, with the sun rays are coming from the 93 million miles away and they're parallel to each other. At the equator, they're concentrated in just a small area. In the polar area, uh, because they're coming in parallel, they uh, concentrate over a larger area. So it doesn't do as much. The Earth right here, remember, is tilted. Because it is tilted at 23.5 degrees, uh, we have different seasons. When the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, it receives more radiation. Another thing to look at when you see this spinning Earth is that there is actually more mass in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. So when we see the amount of carbon dioxide, it can change a bit depending upon what is the tilt of the Earth. Because of the Earth's spin again, as it moves around the sun, we have different patterns of air current. These different patterns of air current actually show us a way of why we have different biases. This showed us how we could establish trade early on. When the explorers were first coming to the Americas, they relied upon this. They knew that if they stayed a little higher, it was easier to sail to the United States. If they went a little lower, that it was easier for them to sail back to Europe. These different areas show us what the rain pattern and the wind pattern are going to be. Another a aspect of what our weather patterns are depends upon the, the currents. Here's a picture of the major ocean currents. Uh, in a way, they're all connected, but the water, as it goes up the coast of uh, Africa there, swings across to South America, it becomes our Gulf Stream, carries the warm water. This warm water is carried upwards and then it splits into an area that goes up towards Russia. This explains why England 
how much higher uh, on Earth than the United States it can be pretty warm because the Gulf Stream brings this warm water up there. What happens here is that as the water gets into the colder uh, polar areas, it starts to sink. And as this cold water sinks, it then starts to reverse flow and actually heads back, continues around the Earth again. And eventually it takes several years and a particular droplet will come back in several years to this area after traveling entirely around the world. And one of the major problems we're worried about is our Gulf Stream. What happens if the polar ice cap up there in Greenland melts more? That puts more fresh water into the area. More fresh water means that the, the water probably wouldn't sink down and the Gulf Stream could shut down. This may have happened several times in the past. This may be why we had the little ice age when parts of the United States stayed cold the entire year. This may have been why uh, we have several stories of uh, uh, Frankenstein, for example. Because of the Little Ice Age, the weather was colder, so people wrote uh, Frankenstein um, when they were in Italy on vacation. It also explains that if you look down the coast of South America, where it says Peru right there, that's the Humboldt Current, as that goes along there, and these mountains are right along the edge, you find desert area right there. So a lot of explanations here about how weather is different in parts of the world based upon the current. Another explanation for weather is that as the winds come off the sea, they hit the mountaintop. The mountain top allows the air to condense and cool, and then as it goes over the mountain, it's dry. And so we have uh, dry areas. We see this out in Oregon, where we have uh, deserts on the eastern side of the mountains. Here's a, a picture of our glaciers. One of the worries that we have right now is that as the world gets warmer, these glaciers are melting and we will have less fresh water for the world. In India and Pakistan, this is a serious problem, where all of the water supply is from the uh, Himalayan mountain glaciers. And as these disappear, uh, the water quality in India and Pakistan is becoming worse. Water itself is pretty consistent. We probably don't have ways of getting more water to the earth at this point. It may have been in the past that we saw comets bring water here, but right now we don't see that. Water is consistent that it, in the ocean, it evaporates up into the air. The clouds may pick it up, it may be stored there for a while, yes, but then it may rain. Rain brings it back to the earth where it either goes into the streams or it's used by us goes into rivers, back to the ocean, so this continues endlessly. Nitrogen is another uh, cycle that we have here. We probably have the same amount of nitrogen. Again, this is a cycle that continues over and over. Uh, lightning and bacteria uh, convert the nitrogen in the atmosphere into nitrogen that can be used by plants animals and plants and use it and we then as consumers of animals and plants are able to get the nitrogen from them and the cycle continues endlessly. The last cycle is uh, the carbon dioxide cycle. This is the one we're so worried about right now because as it uh, is being changed by global warming we're seeing less carbon available. One of the wonderful things about plants is that they are able to take this carbon dioxide and remove it. They can take it, remove it, and turn it into carbon. They can turn it into oxygen. A huge problem, of course, is can the plants do it by themselves? And in the past, they didn't have to. That as these plants 
uh, decompose they went underground and gradually over thousands of years uh, it was assimilated back into the earth again one of our problems is that our gas and oil our coal has taken thousands of years to get to that state and so when they're brought back into the carbon cycle they stay up in the atmosphere and are not utilized again 